So first of all, the company hosting the event is called Haiku. Our mission as a company is to bridge the gap between design and code. Uh, just a second here. Uh, so we're a startup, we're a Y Combinator alum, uh, and we've raised some venture capital, though we haven't announced that anywhere. This is actually probably the most publicly I've ever said that, so, meh. <laughs> Um, DS is a brand new project by the Haiku team. It's a soon-to-be open-source, cross-platform design system framework. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that before we're done tonight. Finally, I'm Zach Brown, one of the founders of Haiku. Uh, I'm a career designer, developer, and manager of designers and developers. Uh, my life's work thus far is to bring design and code together. Uh, this is essentially the genesis of Haiku. And it's also what brings us to design systems, bringing design and code together. So let's talk design systems. Ask three people what a design system is, and you'll get at least three answers. Is it a set of UI components? Is it a pattern library? Is it documentation? Is it a process for bringing people together across disciplines? Well, yes, it's probably all of these things. The what a design system is depends entirely on your organization. But the best distillation I've ever heard of design systems focuses on the why. Why design systems? For brand consistency across software. There are some fancy brands represented here in the audience tonight. In this room, we have folks from Google, from Visa, from Netflix, from Volkswagen, from IDEO, to name a few. Now, if you saw yourself looking around just now, wondering who these celebrities are in our midst, that is the power of brand. For these multi-billion dollar companies, their brands are among their single greatest assets. And software is a vehicle for brand. Apps and websites are increasingly where brands engage with their users. Software is now center stage for brand activations. So cool. Just slap a logo onto every title bar and loading screen, and we're done, right? <laughs> Branding. Uh, it's a little bit harder than that. In today's world, where UX is king and design is a differentiator, branding software means expressing a holistic brand identity, down to uh, colors, typography, sizings, shadows, border radius, spacing, and of course, logos and verbiage. Uh, I love cooking, and I'm a big fan of the New York Times cooking. Every time I use the app, it feels premium. I don't mind paying for it. And across web, mobile web, and the iOS apps, the experience is consistent. Uh, my partner and I host potlucks with friends all the time. Uh, cooking comes up, or New York Times cooking comes up quite often at these potlucks. Oh, this old thing, just a riff on a recipe I found on New York Times Cooking. This is a branding success story. It's not just the software or the apps, the pixels, even the product that my friends and I love, it's the brand. So, let's talk software. Different platforms like iOS, Android, and web all require different skill sets. Different programming languages, different tools, different operating systems, even different ideologies. In most companies, there are entirely separate teams who barely interact with each other, who build software for the company's different platforms. What's more, the technology evolves. React is the bee's knees for the web right now. But it's only been that way for a few years. Before that, it was Angular. Before that, Bootstrap, jQuery. Anyone old enough to remember MooTools? Scriptaculous, uh, Flash, <laughs> even on mobile, Kotlin is the greatest new thing on Android. Swift is only a few years old on iOS. Just this month at DubDub, Apple announced Swift UI, the newest way yet to create UIs for Apple platforms. Flutter's a new contender out of Google, React Native out of Facebook. This is not stable ground. And that's fine. I mean, new tech means empowerment. It means new possibilities. Change is good, right? Right? Anyway, software is hard enough. Let's throw brand into the mix. Brands evolve. Brands are alive. 
What happens when the complexity of ever-evolving technology compounds with the complexity of ever-evolving brands? You can see the highly scientific formulation. Oh, someone tell me. Thanks. Uh, you can see this highly scientific formulation here. Uh, you've got problems. So, design systems to the rescue, right? But back to that what question. What's a design system again? Different teams use different solutions. There's no one definition. Maybe you maintain a team style library in Figma. Uh, but how does that handle documentation? Or how does that help your folks, uh, the folks on your team who use Sketch? Envision DSM, Adobe XD, they have interesting takes on design system managers using visual tools for collecting colors and typography into one place. But these inherently live inside design tools which have no connection to your brand's software. Remember, back to the why of design systems, brand consistency in software, not in Adobe XD. This is the crux of the problem we're here to discuss tonight. The ideators of the brand, the designers, live in design tools. The builders of software, the developers, live in code. Yet a design system should be a useful tool for both. So, if it's not going to be a Figma style library, and if it's not going to be an in, um, Envision DSM or Adobe XD, what about code? We can get code out of design tools. There's ways to generate code, um, and developers certainly work in code. Could that be the common denominator for our design system? I think we're getting warmer. So let's talk UI components. If you're using only one tech stack, for example, if all of your software is in React, then UI components are the way to go. You can maintain a library of reusable components in one place through a brute force handoff between designers and developers. Just you know, keep your UI components up, just up, up to date with Adobe XD and we're good. Um, this has some limitations though. You, namely, UI components don't work across platforms. Think back to New York Times cooking. They can't use React components because they have a lovely native app. UI components fall short across platforms because of opinions about rendering. This is the very core of the technical difference between iOS, Android, and web, is each platform has strong opinions about how they get pixels onto screens. So any single UI component definition will necessarily stomp on the toes of other platforms. Is there a way we can be less opinionated about rendering while still delivering consistency across platforms. Why? I'm glad you asked. Enter design tokens. Circa 2014, Gina Ann and a team at Salesforce, including one of our panelists here tonight, Mr. Kalig, uh, Delmont Prigion. Is that close? Okay. Uh, uh, they coined, and I'm way too happy with myself for that, they coined the term design tokens to describe a way to break out the atoms of your design system into data, plain old markup in YAML or JSON. Salesforce released a, a tool called Theo, which takes design token inputs and outputs snippets of code for different platforms, including iOS, Android, web, CSS, JavaScript. Uh, since then, Amazon has also released a tool called Style Dictionary, which takes some of the learnings of Theo several years, uh, years newer and kind of is like a Theo++ in some ways, heavier guns. That said, present-day design tokens have some challenges. First, this markup language lives in a brave new world. It's a new format, YAML or JSON, and everyone who's maintaining the design system needs to learn how to wrangle it. It's kind of like CSS or SAS, but it's its own thing. Further, design tokens can become quite complex when you're expressing a complex palette or branching sets of typographic definitions for different, you know, different form factors or different devices, YAML or JSON can quickly become unintelligible, uh, maintainable only to the very special folks who know the pipe works, who can dive it down in there and, and change just the right level of indentation. Um, it, it, that's a problem. <laughs> Finally, the output of Theo and Salesforce, uh, sorry, Theo and um, Style Dictionary is essentially code gen. It gives you snippets of code, but it doesn't help you patch them into your code base. And if you've worked with code gen before, 
Uh, you know that it can fall out of sync with living code bases quite easily. It requires discipline and patience to keep things in sync, and often native devs will just throw up their hands and say, just show me the red line, show me the picture, I'll just implement it myself. Back to the old days of the brute force handoff, which is kind of what we want to get rid of, right? We want to kill the handoff. So, uh, now time for a quick shameless plug, and then I'll get out of your way and we can move on to the panelists. Um, let's talk about Diaz. This is the project that our team is working on. Diaz is a design system... Am I still there? Okay, good. It's a design system framework. The core of Diaz is a design token format built on reusable components with strong typings. So whereas in React you might create a UI component which you can reuse, in DS, you create a design token component, which you can reuse. So it ships with prefabs, we call them for colors, for typography, uh, for icons, for all of your design primitives, uh, and you can just pull them kind of out of a toolbox, instantiate them, and you're off to the races. It's also strongly typed. It's built on TypeScript. We use the TypeScript compiler, and then a transpiler on top of that to take your strongly typed design token definitions in TypeScript and build strongly typed frameworks for iOS and packages uh, for Android, and node modules uh, for the web. Diaz also ships with design tool extractors, which automate the parsing of design tokens from design tools. So the workflow we imagine is that you can attach these extractors to either GitHub or a tool like Abstract, where you're versioning your sketch files, or to your own uh, continuous integration server. And then every time you make, or even Dropbox, and every time you make a change to your design file, you can automatically parse it out. You get all of your typography, all of your images, your PNGs at 1x, 2x, 3x, 4x resolution, uh, all of those goodies, your palette, all of that available in code, automatically, across platform, and strongly typed. Uh, soon, you will even be able to do code comments in line. Actually, I'll just show you in the demo. Um, the final sort of somewhat magical innovation of Diaz is this ability to do what we call live design, or hot updates. Uh, and this is other sort of demo. Testing, yeah. The lighting is not superb, uh, but hopefully you can kind of see what's going on here. I've got two devices, iPhone, Android phone. They're both running uh, native apps. This one's written, I'll show you up here. <laughs> this one's written in Kotlin, this one is written in Swift, so pure native apps. Over here, we have an example Diaz project. Here's where you can see these design tokens defined in one spot in this TypeScript file, uh, down to like, the, so you see palette, you see sizes. Um, this is code. It's up to you to express this however you want to express it. Those design tool extractors I was talking about are meant to be imported as their own sort of black box modules, like a DLL in Windows land, or just like an NCAN package you install from somewhere, from God knows who authored it, uh, right? And that, kind of treat your design file like that, this thing you can reach into and pull values out of. Uh, let me just cut to the chase here. Uh, with the hot updates, what you can do is stuff like this. Change your values and watch what happens to the devices. I just change those colors live. Uh, that extends beyond colors, so I can change both of these, change that gradient, you can change fonts, you can change sizes. Due to strong typing, you get nice little goodies like this. Font autocomplete inside your, your code editor. It might feel really intuitive because we get that all the time in anywhere but code editors, but here it is right here in VS Code, just because type devs are easily built around statically analyzed fonts. Let's change the size as well. So this is live design. This is the idea that you can design in context, inside your real software, um, hook this up to your CI tools, even from your design tools. I don't have that demo set up, but it's actually a thing you can do uh, today uh, with DS. Um, and you can even change things like strings. Uh, on our website, ds.org, we show a little example of like a quick and dirty internationalization setup where you have like Chinese, Spanish, and English strings, and you can just refer to them here, again, because it's all code, and then you see the headings update on both of those as well. So that is, yes, that's the, that's the core of it. Um, Diaz will be open source. We are currently in a private beta. We're onboarding folks one at a time, generally in person, um, but that's, that's not a hard and fast rule. Uh, even the folks we're onboarding early, we're giving full access to the source code on GitHub, so it's really, like, we're not, we're not hiding anything there. The only reason we're doing a private beta is to get direct feedback, like a tight feedback loop before we open the gates. 
Um, to everyone who's here tonight, if you're interested in getting private uh, access to our private beta, uh, find me after the event, after the panel. I'll be here. Uh, I'll find a spot to set up, maybe like right here. Just come chat, and uh, we'll, get you, we'll get you set up. And I think that is it for me. I will. Um, we're going to take a quick break. If anyone wants to hit the bar again for a refresher, uh, let's take five or ten minutes, and then we will kick off the panel. Thank you all very much.